Uh, okay, uh, hi. So, can people hear me here? All right. That one, yes. Uh, let me get some stuff set up here. Um, okay, a um, few people are here. Let me go ahead and, um, I don't know, this might be kind of a short session today. We'll see. Um, I've got uh, something that I might have to do here, but, um, but uh, yeah, as usual, if anybody has questions, um, go ahead and feel free to kind of shout them out. Um, I was mainly just thinking about kind of reviewing the um, the second assignment, see if anybody had any questions about those, about about what we just completed here. Um, and and then, yeah, we can maybe talk a little bit about the next assignment. And um, also this week's materials here, so. So, yeah, before, um, um, Maybe I'll bring up the, the second assignment, see if anybody wants to any, ask any questions about that. But um, um, I'll see here. I, I, so I did get back kind of some general feedback on that um, to everybody here. Uh, So, so I mean, I, I think, um, oh, I got the, I got the assignment here. Let me, let me bring up the example solution here that I had posted. Um, okay, well, I mean, most people were fine on, on the second assignment. Um, I, I don't know, I had one or two things that I kind of maybe wanted to mention. Um, if, if nobody has any kind of specific questions um, on it, uh, on the second assignment. So, um, I mean, it was kind of on purpose that, um, that I had left the data set for the second part the way it was without a header line. So um, probably the most common, what I would consider an error uh, uh, for, for people that had submitted the second assignment was basically reading in the second data set without either specifying no headers or without giving the the names for your the features here so um so again the kind of the the general thing about this is um that um you know you have to be able to, you know, the, to, to look at a data set that, that you haven't used before, be able to read it in and, and explore, you know, and, and, and figure out kind of what's there um, and use it correctly, right? So, and, and not, not to mention also, you kind of have to get good at using your tools. So you have to, have to find um, how you can, you can find documentation, you know, reference documentation for the, the libraries that you want to use, you know, so, 
I tend to use the contextual help, but you can also, you know, just go directly to uh, Pandas or, or Scikit-Learn and, and get the doc documentation from there as well. So, but yeah, in, in particular, you know, to handle this this data set correctly with the exam data, I mean, you, you really had to do something about, so by default, the read CSV is going to use the first line in the data file as a header information. So basically as the names of the features, right? And if you don't have that information in there, you either have to provide it by like providing the names um, explicitly. So if you do that, it won't use the first line as, as the header information. Um, it will use the first line as data. Or, you know, another thing you could do is just specify that um, 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 there's a couple of things you could have done here, but you can, you can specify that um, there's no headers. So, so if you use header is um, none here um, and then just give names to the features. So. So anyway, I don't know. the 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 issue isn't so much that you know you have a nice name for the features. The the issue really, if you didn't do that, was you end up kind of ignoring the first line of data. So you end up doing the fit with only ninety nine instead of a hundred. So so there really should be a hundred sample. There 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 are a hundred um, samples in this second data set here for this um, assignment. So, you know, by kind of dropping one of them, you're not using all the data that you have if, if you didn't do something to um, ignore these, uh, uh, to, to, to say that there's no header line in this data here. So, so that mostly manifests itself in that if you do a fit, even if you do it using the um, the, the default values for logistic regression, you wouldn't get these same um, parameters. You'd get slightly different values if you're only using 99 of the 100 um, samples um, in the data set. So, so that was one way I could, I could detect that uh, uh, people weren't um, using all the values in there. So. Um, the other, so yeah, we, maybe we ought to talk a little bit about this week's materials as well. So um, this week is, is pretty important. Um, so starting this week and next week, um, we're looking at um, at our, uh, the, what is it, chapter four from our textbook here. It's kind of a big chapter, so I've broken it up over what three weeks basically um so but kind of so, so the the heart of our machine learning course here is really this week and next week you know so talking about looking at linear regression and gradient descent um and then next week we'll look at um learning curves and um, um uh, fitting polynomials um and um, some other issues so So uh, kind of as I discuss a little bit in my announcement here, it, it's important because, um, you know, s s really learning like the scikit-learn framework or other machine learning libraries is, is, is kind of really, to me, it's, it's a secondary goal of a, of a graduate level class like this in machine learning. So no matter what framework you might be using or, or even implementing some of these machine learning methods by hand, you know, you, you won't kind of be able to, to, to understand things deeply until you get into sort of the details of, of how these algorithms work, right? And, and that's really kind of what this week and next week are about, you know. So we're going to try and, you know, you won't be an expert at, at machine learning, you know, but um, try and give an introduction to, you know, what's really happening on uh, a linear regression in particular um, and logistic regression. You know, we'll look at both of those over the next three weeks here. 
but there's a lot of common things. Um, so uh, the, the other methods that we'll look at, like support vector machines and trees and um, cave nearest neighbors and other things, that they all kind of use the, these, these common ideas, you know. So, so we're defining a cost function and then we're fitting, um, uh, we're using some sort of an optimization method to fit a set of parameters for whatever machine learning technique that we're using. So in that sense, kind of what we're looking at this week is kind of foundational to understanding machine learning, right? So, so yeah, and, and, and I hope people have been um, kind of making use of sort of the review material. So it'll really help you to understand these at a deeper level if you at least are somewhat comfortable with, um, you know, the basic calculus, um, basic sort of linear algebra concepts, right? So we'll be um, formulating kind of all of our mechanisms this week and next as as systems of linear equations, or or well, as 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 a um, as, as a matrix expression, basically. So, so that's kind of why it's important that, that you kind of re, re either, uh, hopefully it's a, a bit of a review or, you know, ho hopefully you've, um, you know, had seen at least some of these things before, you know, so nor know the basics of, um, of, of what gradients are and, and derivatives for calculus and, and maybe have done at least uh, a course on on matrices or linear algebra, you know, and, and also probability statistics would be helpful as well. So, but if not, um, um, hopefully you you have done you know looked over some of those review materials that I had, um, or if you haven't, that that you try and look over those now as you're starting to look at um, our materials this week for linear regression. So. Um, So yeah, I mean, back to assignment two. Another thing um, I'll just point out here. So I had mentioned this in my kind of discussion for the the when I returned assignment two. Um, so for logistic regression, this is one of the things that we'll be talking about this week. So actually, next week we'll get into. Um, so, so, so this week we're looking at linear regression and gradient descent, which is sort of the basics of machine learning. Next week we'll get into um, these kinds of um, regularization techniques um, for linear regression. And then the week after that we'll get into sort of the details of logistic regression. So, so both linear, linear regression and logistic regression, you can uh, you can apply what's known as regularization, which you can think of as a type of penalty for um, having weights that are too big or parameters that are too big. So um, in, in this assignment too that we did this week, um, if, if uh, by default the logistic regression does a little bit of this regularization, but if you specify that we have no penalty here. So by default, it uses what's known as L2 regularization. But if you turn that off, uh, you won't get exactly the same parameters that I said you would get here. So, so you would get, um, well, these, but you'll get exactly the same that you would get with um, using the stats model, right? So here, because basically stats model is doing no regularization. Right. So if you turn off all of the penalty or all the regularization, uh, you should get exactly the same parameters, whether you're using scikit-learn or whether you're using stats model, um, like we did here. So. And you should, I mean, you know, one thing, so some people did you know, they, they, you got the scikit-learn correct, but, but had some issue with the, the stats model. So, so one, of, one of the points of this was, was really, I, I hope people would realize that, you know, you're doing the same thing. So you're doing a logistic regression here or in the first task, you were doing a linear regression. 
So, you know, kind of one of the points was you should have, you should have been able to kind of look at the output that you got from stats model and seen that um, like, like for when we did linear regression that I got exactly the same thing. So for linear regression, uh, the default for scikit-learn, if you do a basic linear regression, is to do it without any regularization or anything. So you should get exactly the same uh, fitted parameters if you look at, um, if you fit it with all the data, you should get, you know, um, these same parameters. So a, a slope and intercept parameter with these values um, using scikit-learn and you would get exactly those same values if you use stats model, right? So, so the default for both of these methods, both of these libraries um, is to do the same thing here, right? And in, in here are the, the, the important values, the coefficients, um, the constant coefficient and the x one. And, and again, um, after, after you watch the videos for this week, these will make a lot more sense, right? So, so you'll understand kind of um, um, after looking at how linear regression works, what it means, how, what, what these parameters are and how we're fitting these um, this week. So, Um, so anyway, and, and um, likewise for logistic regression, um, um, they really are doing exactly the same technique whether they're using those two libraries. And there are other libraries, so there are other ways to perform a linear regression. So you could do it using um, SciPy has, has a basic way. We've already saw, saw the, uh, no, that's not true. This week you'll see um, that we use NumPy's um, polyfit a lot to also fit a polynomial, including to fit a, um, a degree one polynomial, which is basically to fit a line to a set of data. So. Um, yeah, and the other thing, I, I didn't take off any points if you didn't, weren't able to figure out how to visualize the decision boundary here. So that's another concept that we're going to be talking about um, in the next two or three weeks here, right? So when you fit a, a regression problem, you just get a, a model. So it can be a line or it can be a higher dimensional function. So it can be a, a polynomial that you fit to your data, right? Uh, but when you do a logistic regression, you're making a model that comes up with, it's going to end up with some sort of a, what's known as a decision boundary. So some sort of a function that, that describes the, the, um, how you divide up your feature space. So in this case, if you fit a linear logistic regression, you get a linear decision boundary, right? And in this case, um, you know, maybe a nonlinear logistic regression would be better. So you can, you can imagine that maybe if we had a little bit of nonlinearity, uh, you could have a decision boundary that would correctly get all of the admitted on one side and all the, the not admitted cases on the other side, right? And, and I guess another thing that, that you can maybe see by just looking at this is that, so, so notice what, what is being represented by the data if you plot it. Um, as exam one versus exam two here, right? So, so we're more likely to admit students who did kind of average on both, did, did a bit above average on both tests than we, it was, so we're a little bit less critical. So if, if you got lucky on one of the two tests, but, but we're really bad on the other two tests, um, um, you're not as likely to be admitted. You had to show at least kind of medi above average performance on both tests. Um, to, to, um, um, to, 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 to pass this admit or no admit decision here, right? So that, that's kind of what this visualization is, is, should be telling you when, when you look at this here. So. So anyway, in this case, uh, and again, don't worry if, if you didn't get this. Um, as, as I told most people that were asking about this, I, I kind of, I, I, I kind of, from the coefficients that you get back, 
you can determine what the line is of the decision boundary, right? And we'll talk a lot more about this um, um, in the next two or three weeks here. Um, so actually three weeks from now, when we talk about, when we look at the details of how logistic regression works, we'll also look at, um, come back to this idea of these decision boundaries for a classification problem here. So. All right, um, what else? So I don't know if I had too much more to say about assignment two, unless some people wanted to ask some specific questions about it. I still had some lingering doubts about things in here. This probably wasn't really a great example of precision recall curves. So, um, but um, if you did it, so another common kind of problem was you really you need to use um, you need to use the decision function. So if, if you just pass in the raw uh, predictions, so so the predictions are after you apply um, the the function. So the predictions are are basically zero or one for a logistic regression, as we talked a little bit in our um, materials last week, right? But as, as we'll see a little bit more of later on, um, um, these, um, the, the, the prediction of, of admit or no admit, you know, or zero or one, are after you apply a threshold, um, like, like the decision boundary here. Uh, but there are most of these methods that we'll look at that do, um, uh, that can do classification. They, they give you um, what's known as a decision function. So you can really think of this as like a probability score. So most of these will give you a score like, you know, I have a, um, um, a decision that it's, uh, there's a 10% chance that it's a, that it's a no admit, which means that it's a 90% chance that it's admit, you know, or vice versa, right? So when, when we're talking about um, a binary um, classification here. Um, you'll, you'll have a single score, which you can think of as, as the probability that it's the, the positive case. Right. So anyway, um, yeah, so another, I mean, I want to call it common, maybe two or three people were given the, the raw, were given the, um, the, the, the prediction instead of the raw probability decision in here. Um, and if you do that, you won't get quite the right looking kind of, you won't, you won't get the right precision and recall scores from this function. And if you plot them out, they'll look a little bit kind of strange. So. Um, all right. Yeah, I don't know if that, um, um, if anybody wants any more information about the second assignment, let me know, right? Otherwise, I'll probably go ahead um, and uh, move on to some other topics here. So yeah, I was thinking about, you know, talking about the third assignment, although, um, until you've at least started on the materials for next week. So uh, a lot of the, the next assignment uh, relies, it, it's working with polynomial regression. Um, so you'll not, all, but of course you'll need to, to work through the materials for this week, but you'll ha also have to at least get started with the materials for next week um, a bit before you can um, begin to um, understand well what we what we uh, need to work with you know what, what you need to do on the next assignment here so for that reason I was probably only going to talk a little bit about assignment three so so I, I assume there'll probably be uh, a lot more questions on it next week once people have, have had a chance to um, look at the materials this week and have at least got started on 
the things like the learning curves and the polynomial regression and stuff that we talk about and, and regularization that we talk about next week. Um, so yeah, maybe I will um, kind of quickly go through, um, let me take a look at our materials for this week here. So yeah, you should be going through the, um, the, the linear regression and the gradient descent um, portions of chapter four this week, um, at least. Although I would encourage you to also try and get started on the others so you can also get started on the assignment, right? So if you haven't got started on these, you need to get started on these and then maybe also be looking at next week's materials as well so you can begin working on the next assignment here. Um, so for this week, um, we're going to be diving into the details of how linear regression works, right? So, and, and, and actually after looking at, at the, the materials in this first notebook in the first part of chapter four, um, um, you'll kind of understand, you, you actually you even be able to do it by hand. So we actually show um, doing it by hand, like um, using the normal equation here um, um, uh, in this week's materials. Um, So the, the simplest case uh, that we look at kind of this week, um, so, so we start off with a, a regression problem of, of a single variable. So we've got um, a single um, feature, which is the, the, the size of ho houses in square feet. And we want to try and predict the, the price of the house, right? So um, kind of one thing you ought to understand is that, um, you know, I mean, Everything we talk about in this notebook here um, can be generalized if we have more than one input feature, right? So, so we only work with a single feature in our example for this notebook, but, but th this will, you know, uh, a regression like this, like a linear regression like this, will work perfectly fine if, if we have, you know, two features, like, like the size and the number of bedrooms or three features or, or, or even more features, right? Although in that case, instead of fitting a line to your data, you know, if, if you have two features, you'd be fitting like a plane, a hyperplane, or well, a, a plane for two-dimensional data. Or if you have three features or, or more features, you'd be fitting um, um, a hyperplane, a, a higher dimensional. But all of those are really linear, they, they, they in the sense, so. so when you fit a line to a set of data, I mean, the first thing I, you should kind of understand is that you are making a um, assumption about the relationship between your independent and your dependent variable, right? So, I mean, not all functions or, or not all data is linear, right? There, there could be a nonlinear relationship between house size and the price, right? In which case, doing a linear regression or fitting a linear model might not be the best thing to do. You might wanna fit um, a more complex function to it, right? So, I mean, and that really depends on, you know, that, that's kind of doing science, really, or doing statistics, right? So, to, to determine things like that, you really have to look at your data and, 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 and think about what it's telling you, you know? So, does it look like a linear model is, is a good model for my data, or does it look like the data is more complex, right? So here, I mean, it, it could be a little bit debatable, right? But, but, you know, a linear model might not be so bad, at least on the range of data that we have here, right? So, so I mean, it, it does look in general that as the house 
the, the size increases, uh, we're getting a corresponding constant increase in the price of the house, right? With some noise, so, so there'll always be some noise uh, in, in your data here. But, but you know, to, to a first sort of approximation, a linear model might make a relatively good model of, of our data here. You know, so being able to give us relatively good predictions, if we just know the size of the house, well, what we expect to be its selling price, um, what, what the value of the house should be. So. Um, so really, um, in order to understand how linear regression works, I mean, you, you first have to understand how, how do you fit a line to, um, um, to, well, how do you fit a line to two points of data, right? So if you, if you remember back to your basic, um, again, I'm assuming, I'm assuming everybody has taken a course in this back in high school or even before. Uh, some, some sort of a course in ge basic geometry and algebra, right? So any two points, um, you know, so this is usually like a geometry course. Uh, the two points define a line um, in two dimensions, right? Um, and, and you can define the equation of a line that would go through, like if we have, the, the, these were actually the first two points in our house data set here. Um, so well yeah anyway so it was just it was just the the, the first two points um uh, point zero and point one or, or sample zero and sample one here all right so if, if you go back to kind of your um, algebra or geom basic geometry um, um this is known as the slope intercept equation of a line um and if you have two points um, we can we can figure out the the slope of these two points, which is simply the the, the slope is is a description of how y changes as a function of how x changes. Um, if we're talking about a slope of a line here, right? So the so slope is really just uh, the 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 ratio of the change in y by the change in x, right? So here, you know, if, if you plug those in, so y, so, so from, from here to here, y changes from 440 to 330, right? So that's, that's your change in y, and, and x changes from 2100 to 1600. So if, 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 if you plug those in, that gives you your slope of, of close to 0.14 here, which means you, know, you, should, you should intuitively understand what slope means, because this is also going to be important when we talk about gradients and gradient descents and optimization methods here, right? So uh, intuitively, this, this means that for every um, For every change in, in uh, of one square foot, we have a change of 0.13 um, in the price, basically. Or if, if it makes it easier, you can multiply that by 100. So for every change at 100 square feet, the price changes by 13. Actually, these are in, in um, thousands of dollars here. So by, by $13,000, right, is what the slope is telling you um, here, right? Um, so yeah, um, um, as we say here, um, and and you know, again, this is good to understand because this will this will help you understand uh, why there are like um, why we have the parameters that we do when we try to f do a linear regression, right? So so here, you know, th there are many lines that have the same slope. You know, there's the one that goes to these two points, but but there's a line parallel to it, but but up 
you know, above them, there, there's a line, and there's actually infinitely, so, so all the lines that have the same slope, but if you just move them um, um, up or down, um, um, can be defined by, by that same low, by, by that same slope here. So to find the one particular line that goes exactly through these two points, we, also, we, we need a second parameter in this case. So, so, so the slope isn't enough to, to tell us which line we're talking about. We need the slope and one more parameter. Um, so typically for the slope intercept, that second parameter is this B or the intercept parameter. So as I described here, you know, if, if again, you can use this basic equation, rearrange it, um, and then we can use like one of our points to figure out what the intercept has to be in order to get the line that exactly goes through these two points here. Um, All right, so that was, that was a kind of a, a basic review of some stuff that I hope that you guys vaguely remember from, you know, high school or maybe even before. So at this point, though, now we're going to be starting getting back to this class, right? So um, let's say instead of two points, so, so now the question is, if we have more than two points, so, so, so we have two points, there's, there's going to be a line that fits them perfectly, right? But if we have more than two points, um, what is kind of the best line? If, if I want to fit a, a line that models these three points, what's the best line to choose, right? Um, and that's, that's a bit of a nonsens nonsensical question, unless we formally define what we mean by best, okay? So, if we can come up with some idea of, of, of what we mean by the, the best line for, for these three points, um, then, we, then we could maybe find what that best line is, right? And that, that's what a cost function is. Um, 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 and this is also known as the fitness function. Um, it probably has some other names that I'm blanking on right now. So we'll usually call this the cost function or the fitness function. So this is a way of coming up with a formal measurement of what we mean by um, the best fit, or you know, the best model. In, th in this case, the best fitting line for some set of points, right? So yeah, I mean, you know, the best line, you know, um, if we don't have some formal notion, you know, maybe it's this one, maybe it's the one that goes through these two points, right? I mean, it, uh, it could be the one that goes through these two points, or maybe some other line that doesn't go through any of the points, but, but it's some compromise between these, right? So it's maybe a little bit tough to, to intuitively think of, of which one of those possibilities might be best for these three points. But when you see more data points, you have some idea. So if you think of these as data points that maybe have a linear relationship, but there's a little bit of noise added, um, you know, before I define what the, the, the best, what, what, what a good cost function is, you can probably have an intuitive idea, you know. So now, with a bunch of points like this, you know, a, a line that goes like this direction, perpendicular to the one I have drawn, that doesn't seem to be a very good fit at all. I mean, it, it looks like these these points, ha if they have a linear relationship, um, have what's known as a positive slope. So so when the size increases, the, the price of the house increases, right? And when the size decreases, the price decreases. So that's, that's a positive slope, um, something like this. And, and actually our first line, it was, it was 
um, it was a little bit at random, but, but this was the same line that we had that was going through these two points. But this line doesn't look too bad, possibly intuitively, a, as a good fit um, for our data points here. Maybe it's a little bit high, and so if I was moving this around, I might have something with a pretty similar slope. I might move it down a little bit to go th more through, um, uh, you know, down about here maybe. Right, but with about that slope. Um, so anyway, I mean, I mean, you know, if you follow this or if you've worked through this or once you've worked through this notebook, this is leading up to the idea. So, so there is a way that we can define um, a cost function, which is some measure of, you know, so is this the best line or is, is it like the line up here? Or maybe is it a little bit better a line like right here? Or, you know, like a, a, a perpendicular line, is that a better fit, right? Um, so once we define that measure, Um, then of all the possible lines, um, we can find, we, we can use our cost function or our fitness function to, to determine which is the better line, if we can agree on what that cost function should look like, right? Uh, but yeah, before we get there, so, you know, uh, you've actually already fit a line to this data, so you could use the stats model um, OLS object, um, to, to find what is considered the best fitting line here, or you could use scikit-learn's um, linear regression to, f to fit the best line here. Here's another method that you can use. Um, we can use polyfit. So polyfit, if you ask for a degree one polynomial, is going to fit a line that has uh, basically the, the, say, uh, you know, the, the slope-intercept form that we were talking about. So it's going to fit a, a linear line here. So this tells you, if you do that, if you, if you ask to, to polyfit to fit the best line, and again, we haven't defined this, what we mean by best yet, we haven't defined this cost function, but it tells you the very best line you can fit to this, this data, this house size, um, in order to try and predict the price, has a slope of 0.13, pretty close to the slope that we had with this line here, like we were saying, that, that looks like a pretty good slope. Um, uh, what was it? Sorry to go back here. Um, um, oh yeah, point one three eight. So, um, so polyfit is telling us that point one three four. Um, is the best slope for, for, for the best fitting line for this data. Uh, and, and the intercept is 7, 1. So like I was saying, uh, our intercept was 107 here. So the intercept is basically, if, if I extended this over so we could see where x is 0, that, that's the place where the line crosses the, um, the y-axis, right? So, you know, like I was saying, you know, the slope is pretty close, but, but if we move the, the line down a little bit, so instead of an intercept of 107, if the intercept is more like about 71, um, which is, is a line pretty parallel to this one, but a little bit lower, that's the best fitting line here for our data, right? So and if you plot the line that um, polyfit gives you, and again, you would get exactly the same slope and intercept if you use scikit-learn or if you used um, stats model or um, scipy or many other libraries that can fit uh, do a linear fit to a set of data here so so anyway you get this line here that that's in some sense um, polyfit is telling you this is the best line the best fitting line to our data here You'll get the same line if you use um, Seaborn. So by default, Seaborn's um, um, LM plot does a best fitting um, 
um, ordinary least squares fit. Um, so I'll give you that and also give you the, um, the confidence interval around it. So, but that should be exactly the same line that we just got with polyfit here. So um, again, before we get to the um, cost function, we can generalize that slope intercept equation that we we're doing. So for a degree one polynomial, uh, you can think of that as, as the model has two parameters um, that, that machine learning academics like to call theta, right? So they call it theta zero and theta one, but this is exactly the same equation we were working with, right? So if you can determine the, the correct values for these two parameters, and again, these are the, the same intercept and slope. So theta one would be our slope or M that we called it before, and theta zero would be the intercept or B that we called it before from your high school geometry or, or class or, or algebra class. Right? We're just generalizing because, um, I mean, to skip ahead a little bit, we can fit, more complex functions than linear functions. So we can have like um, a, a, an x squared. So this is x to the power of one, but we can have like an x squared term or an x cubed term, All right? Or yeah, I mean, not to confuse, but we can also um, generalize this to having more than a single feature here. So, so, so e even, so still want, want to do a linear fit, but uh, again, you know, so we might have more than um, just the, the size of the house. So, so we might have the number of bedrooms, um, I don't know, the, 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 the number of bathrooms, you know, so all those, but, but again, if those are all, if we want to make a linear model, we could have those multiple parameters and do a linear regression to fit a plane or a hyperplane um, onto, um, that our set of data points um, in, in a higher dimensional space here. Um, so yeah, I, so that was kind of what I was saying here, right? So, so this does generalize. Um, oh, and, and you should watch, um, you know, I encourage you to watch I kind of think of these as supplementary videos, but you ought to watch the um, the, the videos from the uh, Dr. Ng's uh, machine learning course as well on linear regression with one variable and linear regression with multiple variables. So, um, and work through these other notebooks as well here. So, so um, um, these go into more details about this idea as well here. So. All right, and I, I should probably kind of um, speed up a little bit. I'd like to get through this one here before we take a little break. Um, so, so we still haven't got up to, to, to formalizing the idea of a cost function, right? So, so once you have this idea here, you know, whether you, know, you do it for a line of a single feature or a line of multiple features, you know, a hyperplane of multiple features, you know, the, the question still remains. So how do you find these, these parameters uh, that are the best fit, the, the best linear model that, that you can have, right? So, um, but before we get there, you know, so now is where it would be helpful to understand or have uh, taken a course in linear algebra because uh, in order to, take this formalization and be able to do it for like truly large data sets, we really need to be able to um, think of this as a, um, as, as, as a, a vector calculation here. So um, um, multiplying a set of theta parameters times a, theta, a set of features, right? So anyway, th this part of the, the notebook is talking about how we can formalize this to use a linear algebra notation, um, and that gives us a lot of advantages um, 
especially if, if we need to apply this to truly big data sets, you know, so, to, to, so you, you can't really write this as code um, once you have thousands or tens of thousands of features, you know, we, we have to, to, to do some sort of a vector representation of this data here. So. Um, All right, but I'll let you read about that. So, so let me um, kind of finish up here before we take a little break, maybe. Um, um, so let's go back to the, the, the cost function here, okay? So, so we need some way in order to find, so, so I, you know, I, there, there's infinitely, if I can go back to our simplest, so, so this version of our equation here, there, there's infinitely many values of our slope and intercept. So, so how do you find the ones that are best in some sense uh, of our best fit of a line to our data here? So intuitively, you know, again, like I was, like I was trying to argue, you, you can in, probably intuitively pick a pretty good line, something that would be pretty close to the best fitting line here, but how do we formalize that, right? So the simplest answer um, for our cost function is that um, I don't have a if I have a good visualization of it here in this notebook. I guess I don't. Um, so if I can go back to like here. The best, the, the best fitting line, the best fitting linear model is going to be the one that minimizes uh, the distance between the true values and its prediction. So this, this line represents what our predictions would be. Um, you know, so, so if I have a, um, a new house of, that has 3,500 square feet, I'm going to predict that its cost is right here, you know, 500 and, I don't know, 520 thousand dollars, right? Um, so if this actual price is, you know, $600,000, um, I was a little bit off of my prediction. So, so the best um, fitting line is going to be the one that minimizes, um, you know, so I can never be perfect, unless all of my data had no noise and it all exactly fit on an actual line. I can't get have zero prediction error, all right? So um, intuitively, the, 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 the line that's the best fit is the one that minimizes, has the smallest difference between my predictions and the actual values that I'm fitting here. Right. And where your difference is going to be the difference between the, the prediction line, which is the y hat in our notation, and the, the true value. Right. So for this particular value here, we had uh, the, the, the difference from the line to here. So, so the, the, the difference is going to be the distance just on the y axis from your prediction to the true value for each one of these values here. Right. And that's, you know, um, hopefully you followed that. That's, that's in a nutshell what a, what, what a common cost function is, right? So notice, though, it's the magnitude. So it, it doesn't really matter if I was, um, again, to, to go back here, it doesn't matter if, if I was over-predicting or under-predicting. It's just how far away my prediction was. So in some cases, I was under-predicting the price with this line my best fit line. In some cases, I was over predicting like here a little bit, but it's just how far away the, the magnitude of that difference um, is how good or bad my prediction was, right? So here, my predictions were very good because the, I, I was, the, the, the true value of the house was pretty close to my prediction, right? But uh, like here, I had something that was really far off, you know? So for some reason, this, this house, uh, which is pretty small size, was going for almost half a million dollars here, even though it was only 1,500 square feet, a little bit less, right? So anyway, it's, it's that magnitude, right? And, and, and it's, it's, it's not 
you know, the other thing about this is it's not how well you do for a single prediction. So again, you know, for if I just like had one single prediction, I did good for some single predictions, but I did bad, relatively bad for this particular line that we're saying is the best line for others, right? So it's not how you do on a single prediction, it's how you do overall for all of the, the data that you're trying to fit a model to, right? So, so hopefully if you followed my discussion here, what we need to do is we need to sum up the, the magnitude for all of the, the points. So we, had, we need to sum up this magnitude of error, right? The, the, the difference between my prediction and the actual value over all the points that we're trying to fit, right? So some lines, so, so in, in, and, and again, the argument then is that in some sense, this line gives the minimal, if I was to sum up the, the, the errors that I'm making from my, between my predictions and the actual values, that's the best I can do from any other of the infinite lines, you know, models um, that are possible for this data, right? So this line is better than this line. This gives a bigger sum of the errors, right, than, than, than my blue line does here. No line gives a better, gives a smaller sum of the errors than, than um, this best fitting line here. All right. And that's really what the cost function is. So, um, and, and you can come up with different cost functions, which might be a little bit surprising the first time you come across this, but, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, but, and your different cost functions can give sli slightly different answers on what the best fitting line is. So, um, um, an intuitive, cost function that most people come up with on their own when you're first describing this is, well, just take the absolute value, right? So that's known as the mean absolute error, right? And that's a perfectly good um, cost function here. So you just take the absolute value of the difference between the prediction um, and the, the, um, the true value, and you sum those up, right? So that's the MAE of the mean absolute error. But uh, we normally knew, use what's known as the mean squared error, okay? So if you take the difference, so again, this is notation here, but you ought to try and, and try and try, try and look at this, make sure you understand this, right? So we're using our linear algebra. So, so theta times our x gives our hypothesis here, and we subtract y, which is our true value, that gives the difference, that's the magnitude. But instead of taking the absolute value, we take the square of that. So, but if you know, if you square a value, um, it's going to have, it's going to be positive, even if, if you know, if, even if this difference was negative, because we were um, um, underestimating, so that we were less than the true value, so we end up with a negative here, a negative difference. But if you take the square, um, it will become positive, right? Because you don't want to, you can't just sum up. The, the, the differences because um, a, again, some, some of the differences are above and some are below. So if you sum those up, you'll actually get something that's the zero um, for your best line, right? Because the, the best line is gonna be the one that exactly balances all the, your underestimates from all of your overestimates and ends up having a, a, a sum just of the magnitudes of zero here, right? So you, you can use the absolute value to get the magnitudes, or you can use the square. Okay, we um, as as discussed in this notebook, we we use the square, um, the the mean square error. Um, so it, well, we're using the the square error, the sum of the squared error. So this is known as the sum of the square, and then normally we divide that by the number of values m to get the mean sum squared error. So so this is, this is the common. This is the most common cost function that's used for um, regression problems uh, in machine learning, the, the, the mean sum squared error here. So, so I, as I discussed later on, um, um, it, we, it, it, the, the, the square error instead of the absolute error is preferred because it has nice mathematical properties. 
So basically, we can perform gradient descent because the, um, the gradient is defined for a squared function like this. Um, um, the, the square of a function is continuous, whereas the absolute value is not continuous. So we can calculate gradients better when we get to talking about gradient descent or easier using the squared error rather than the absolute error. Um, all right, and um, I kind of want to wrap up and take a little break here. Um, so um, let me say, I mean, you know, um, so there's a little bit more. Um, so we're actually going to be concentrating on using gradient descent in order to, so, so once you've defined the cost function, uh, now we can search all the possible parameters of theta. So, so what you should understand here is, is with this cost function, uh, it gives us an answer. So if I pick two values of theta at random, uh, when we're just trying to fit a line with a single parameter, this will give me a value for what his cost is, right? So if I pick like maybe this line that goes perpendicular, that has a particular theta and um, uh, has a particular slope and intercept. And I can calculate the cost for that line. Um, and then I can calculate the cost for this gray line here. And then I can I calculate the cost for this line. I can calculate the cost for all the infinite lines that I can define that might be fits for my functions, right? So then the question is, how do I find the one that has the smallest cost, right? So, so the argument is that the one with that smallest cost is the best fitting line because it has the smallest sum of the, the difference between the predictions um, and the, um, the, the true value for, for the data that we're trying to fit here, right? So that leads to the idea of, of, um, uh, of an optimization function like gradient descent, or, um, and I'm not gonna, I'll let you read this here. So there are ways to actually um, have an exact solution. So not all machine learning methods have exact solutions, but linear regression does, which is one reason why it's, you know, kind of studied like this. And it's one reason why we, we often use this as our first example of a machine learning method um, in a class like this, right? So um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class, but um, it turns out, you know, so this is an equation. Um, and when you say that you want to find the minimal um, cost, um, that, that means that there are ways to find the minimum of a function. So basically the way to find a minimum of a function is you take the derivative of the function and you find the, the, the location where that function is zero. Those are going to be the locations where the, the function is either a minimum or a maximum, right? If you go back to your calculus, okay? So this function is a little bit more complicated because we have this summation here, but, but the principle is the same. So you can, you can derive the derivative, you can find the derivative of this, and then you can set the derivative to zero um, and then solve that. And that's really what the normal equation is doing um, here. All right. It ends up that, that the expression is going to be a linear algebraic expression, but you can, you can take that, um, set it to zero, and solve, and that, that will find the values for theta. So this will give you an exact solution, right? Um, and again, you don't really have to completely understand the details of where this comes from, but you can actually use that formula and plug it in to use a NumPy. So, you know, if you take, so this is the transpo, transpose, so you, so you take the, the matrix multiplication of, of your X feature matrix transpose times X, take the inverse of that, so the inverse of a matrix, multiply that by the X transpose of X again, multiply that by Y, and that gives you the uh, expression for theta, which should be the minimum um, value of theta. But if you plug that in, you'll get exactly the same values that you get using scikit-learns um, linear regression object or the, the polyfit that we just used above, right? So a 
intercept of 71 and a slope of 0 0.134. All right. Um, Um, oh, well, yeah, I showed this doing it by hand here. So, so using, so at does a matrix multiplication, it's overloaded to matrix multiplication. So, so it's basically doing exactly that same expression known as the normal equation with our uh, X input features and, and our Y labels gives the, the same result for the slope and the intercept. All right, um, and that was basically it for the uh, for this uh, this first um, notebook here, right? So talking about the the cost function and setting up for linear regression. So why don't we go and take maybe uh, five minutes here till about five forty five forty one, um, and I'll come back and kind of look through the other one, maybe a little bit quicker. Um, and then maybe also talk about the, the next assignment, or at least begin talking about it. So, All right, so I'll be back in about five minutes here.
Um, okay, um, I'm back. I don't know if uh, you guys are ready to, to go through these. Um, so uh, to continue on here. Um, so the second uh, topic of this week is uh, gradient descent. Okay, so as, as I talked a little bit briefly and our textbook talked a little bit briefly, um, I mean, there are various reasons um, why, you know, the, the normal equation uh, we can't use in practice. Um, so for one, uh, you know, so it's nice to have exact solutions like this, but lots of machine learning, lots of the other techniques we'll look at, you can't really uh, find an analytical solution. So they don't have an easy way to specify um, the uh, you know the the, the, the to, to to change the cost function and analyze it in a way so that you can find a, a closed form solution. But even if they did, um, there, there's computational issues. Um, so because of the the kinds of calculations you have to do for the normal equation. Um, once you start talking about truly big data and and you know really uh, so, so really, this really isn't an issue unless we're talking about like data sets with more than 10,000 or 100,000 of features or so. But once you, once you get to that size, um, um, you're going to find that it'll take much, much longer to train it. Uh, you know, if you want to do a linear regression using the normal equation, than it would to use um, an iterative optimization solution like gradient descent. Okay. So. And I guess the other the other kind of general thing about gradient descent is that um, most of the time we really don't have closed form solutions. Um, uh, so 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 other techniques that we'll look at are are kind of more complex in that sense. So you have to use an optimization technique. So so it's it's pretty easy usually to define a cost function like we're like we're doing here uh, for linear regression for the other techniques we look at but it's difficult if not impossible to um, uh, to analytically solve those um, so you can have an expression that where you can find the optimal parameters okay so um, that leads us to this idea of gradient descent so again you know I think of this as very important so this is just a general um, technique Right, optimization is, is a general technique. So if you if you can understand the material here in this notebook and and from this part of our textbook, um, it's really useful in lots and lots of other places than e even besides machine learning. Right, so lots of things can be thought of as optimizing parameters once you have some specification, some formal specification of a cost function, like like we just did with our linear regression here. Um, so to understand how it works for the linear regressions cost function, the, 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 the mean of the sum squared error, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe going to have to go through this a little bit faster than I might like here because um, I do need to wrap up, but um, just to motivate it again, so like, like this very first example. So imagine that we're trying to fit a function um, and we already know that the, the, the intercept um, is at y equals zero. So we've, we've reduced it even further, simplified it even further. So we've only got one parameter now that we need to vary, the, the slope, right? So we need to find a line we need to fit a set of data and, and all we need to do is find the slope because we know it goes through um, an intercept of y equals zero uh, in this case, right? So in fact, we're fitting a line here, a very simple line. So one, one, two, two, and three, three means that it has a slope of one, right? So every time x changes by one, y changes by one. And in this case, if this is the, if these are the data points that we're trying to fit, um, there's actually a cost of zero because there the, the, there is a line with a slope of one um, and an intercept of zero that goes exactly through these three points, 
uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3, okay? Um, but, so, I mean, this is a perfectly good set of data points, um, and if you calculate the, the, um, the, the, the mean of the sum squared errors, um, for different lines, right? So, so I'm just going to jump to this this figure here, right? So, like I said, uh, the 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 line with a slope of one uh, and an intercept of zero will exactly go through those three points. So it will have a um, a um, cost of zero, so a, a mean squared error cost of zero when the slope is one, right? But again, remember, there's there's infinitely number of of other possible lines that we could propose as possible fits for those three data points. And this is plotting them here, right? So this, this is, uh, again, so uh, we're, we're ignoring the intercept. So, you know, we could have a slope less than zero, we could have a negative slope, we could have a positive slope, bigger than, bigger than one, so slope of two or three, right? So if, if you plug those in there, though, for the mean squared error, you get uh, this function, right? So this is a function of, uh, this is a plot of the cost function as a function of changing the slope. Uh, again, changing the slope from the ideal slope of one to more negative or more positive, moving, moving away from it in the two different directions. Right? And again, I, I, I urge you to, to make certain that you pay close attention to this part here. So if, if, you, if you understand this, this gives you an intuitive feel for a lot of fundamental things in machine learning um, and, uh, well, kind of uh, many numerical computational methods in general, um, all kind of um, have the same sort of idea, right? So once you've defined a cost function, this, this defines um, uh, a function and we can search this function, right? So, so the idea though is that, so even though there's infinitely many lines, Right, um, this function um, is 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 something that will give us information. So if if I'm not at the optimal, I can use the gradient of this function, basically the slope of this function, at in particular point to tell me whether I need to go, you know, make make my slope bigger to move towards the optimal. So so here the optimal is going to be when we get the smallest cost because we're trying to minimize cost. This, this is what's known as a minimization problem, right? So minimal cost is better um, in, in our uh, formalization of our cost function here, right? Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to skip ahead a little bit here. So, you, you know, if, if we generalize this, so uh, if we go back to having two parameters, so both the slope and the intercept, what you would find, hopefully you can visualize this, is that it, it's not a parabola, but um, so now I'm going to have two dimensions, theta zero um, and theta one. But uh, for, for the two dimensions, and then our third dimension is going to be the, the cost, um, it's going to actually form a nice function, which uh, a little tough to visualize using a contour plot. Um, But um, um, if you've got your um, if you got your plugins working correctly, you can actually also plot this in three dimensions. Um, uh, oh man, so I'm getting that error now. So uh, I thought I had that fixed. Uh, well, anyway, so so you can, you can see it in um, kind of as a contour plot here. So so it ends up forming kind of a bowl. Um, phase zero and theta one, all right? Um, and, and, you know, again, you know, the, the, the cost is going to be optimal uh, down here where um, with a theta one of one and, um, oh, I, I was using a slightly different line here. So uh, we're using a line um, that has a, a slope of, of one and an intercept of one here. So that's why we end up with the minimum right down here at, at one, one uh, again for this function, so. Um, all 
Um, So anyway, the, the, the point of this is that, um, um, so not all cost functions are gonna be quite so nicely um, shaped like this. Um, although it turns out a lot of them for our machine learning methods that we'll look at will be, because what I mean by this is nicely shaped, nicely shaped because there's only one minimum, okay? So, um, um, in, so for the, 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 the mean squared error um, cost function, um, it will be a what's known as a convex function. So if I can go back to just do, having one dimension, um, it'll be convex. So, so that, that means that there's only one minimum, right? And this holds even if I have two, three, or many parameters for the mean squared error function. So it's going to form a nice bowl or a nice hyperbole if, if, if we're in three or, or many higher dimensions than that. But there's, there's no matter how many dimensions, um, um, because of this convexity of it, there's going to be one global minimum and there's going to be no local minimum um, for this particular, for our sum squared error cost function here. So that means that it has the nice property that, um, um, so, so this, this uh, animation was, was trying to demonstrate um, how gradient descent works here and it's still running here so um, to just kind of narrate this as it runs so this first point represents a line with this slope so, so we've got a slope of like negative 0.2 and we've got an intercept of 1700 so as you can see the intercept here of like 1600 or 1700 or whatever it is right so that's that line and if you calculate the cost um, it had a cost over here, so it was up on the bowl here, right? So the way that gradient descent works um, is that you can measure the gradient. So, so by, by taking the derivative of this point with respect to um, our theta zero and theta one parameter, this tells me that, that um, I need, so for like the theta one parameter, if you measure the gradient, it, it's going to tell me that the, the gradient we need to move, um, we need to increase theta one to move towards the optimal um, value. Right? But if you take the gradient with respect to theta zero, we need to decrease it. So it needs to be moving to the left, right? Um, and, and we were kind of doing this by hand, but um, by, um, you know, so, so our next parameter, if you follow the gradient, so, so if you make theta one a little bit bigger and you make um, um, theta zero a, a little bit smaller, we, we can arrive at this next line, right? Um, and all these cases, we, we continually have to um, make theta one a bit bigger and, and theta two a bit smaller. But, but if you keep following the gradient down there, you eventually arrive at the optimal solution. Um, represented by the final um, kind of black gray line here. So. so um, in general, gradient descent, all, all gradient descent algorithms work in that same manner. You, you can start at like a random location, but if you can have some way of measuring the gradient, which is really just the, the slope um, or the derivative of the function um, uh, of your cost function. So, so we're measuring the gradient of our cost function, right? That, that's what these contour lines are here. So if you have some way of, of measuring the gradient with respect to each of your parameters, you can use that information to take small steps in the correct direction. So you're moving towards the, um, the global minimum, okay. All right. So, and again, you know, th this, this, um, I mean, you can still work out. You can still use optimization methods like this for functions that are messier, uh, that might have local minimums or things. But you have to, you have to do other kinds of things. Um, but, um, but yeah. So, so functions that are convex like this, uh, you're guaranteed if you follow the gradients that you will find the global minimum, as long as you um, 
you know, take enough steps as, as long as you keep taking steps long enough. Right? Um, so as is discussed here and in our textbook, so there, there's lots of caveats to this, right? So um, you can get, you can, it can be very slow. So if, if you happen to be some, somewhere where the gradient is changing very slowly, it might take you a very long time if, if your steps are too small. Um, but um, or you can have the opposite problem if your steps are too big. So these steps are what are known as the learning rate. If your steps are too big, you could end up jumping to, to a place where, the, where the, uh, the cost function is higher instead of lower. And if you keep doing that, you'll, you'll actually um, diverge instead of converging down towards the, um, the, the global minimum here, right? So um, I didn't have those illustrations in this, but our textbook talks a little bit about that, it has an illustration of that problem of diverging um, if, uh, you know, for, for gradient descent here. So. Um, so then, so, so, you know, you should understand that, that gradient descent then is a, um, it's an algorithm. So it's an algorithmic, um, process instead of an exact solution like the normal equation, right? So basically it's an iterative algorithm. So, so you, again, you can start with like a random point or you can start at zero, zero, for example, or, or something. Uh, and, and then you just iteratively take small steps um, and where those steps, you use information about the gradients or the slope to determine what direction for each of the parameters you should take your small step in, right? So then, you know, that, that kind of begs the question, so how do you calculate the gradients, right? Uh, and, and again, that's gonna depend on the function. So that, that's, 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 I already mentioned this. This is one of the reasons why we use the, 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 the square of the error, um, because it makes the calculation of the gradient or the calculation of the derivative, um, uh, I mean, relatively easy. Um, as opposed to the absolute value, which um, is, um, uh, you can't really calculate the derivatives like this, right? So um, again, um, for the, sum, the mean squared error function, um, there's a relatively simple form for, the, um, for calculating the gradient with respect to the, each of the parameters, and, and it's this here. And again, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class, to derive this, um, um, although if I if you go back to the um, the um, the cost function, the mean squared error cost function, um, and and again if you know if you go back and think about calculus, if you remember doing derivatives and calculus. Um, you can drive this, you know, so there, there's the summation here. So it's, it's a little bit difficult, but it really is an application of the chain rule. So it's taking two times this, um, and, but, but the summation kind of falls out. And then you have to chain it by taking the derivative of these values in here with respect. So, so again, like I said, I won't go into that, but, uh, but if you look at that, you can kind of see, um, um, if, if you remember back to taking derivatives, where this, this formulation kind of comes out. Um, so, but you don't have to completely understand that to be able to use this here, right? But from this expression, um, you, you could completely implement a gradient descent algorithm because this gives you the derivatives. Once you have those, you can use that with the learning rate to take small steps um, in the correct direction for each of your parameters um, and, um, um, and then follow the gradients um, down to the optimal set of your, your parameters here. So. Uh, oh, and in fact, right, so, you know, I encourage you to spend some time and, and, and understand this. So, and in fact, we, we, we um, give you Python function by hand to um, calculate the gradient um, and to perform um, gradient descent, okay? Um, so, 
Um, and then finally, um, I kind of want to wrap up here and then maybe just discuss a little bit or at least get you guys started on the, the third assignment here. So there's different flavors of gradient descent. So we can do um, um, So you can do gradient descent where you um, um, take one item at a time. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the that's what's known as um, um, the, the, that's your basic standard uh, gradient descent here. Um, so so the, the basic difference is that um, so when you do your standard gradient descent, um, you calculate the gradients for each individual item one at a time, right? Uh, and, and then you take a step. Uh, but you can do what's known as batch gradient descent. Um, where you take um, a set of um, items um, together and, and, and you calculate. So, so here, for, for batch gradient descent, um, instead of doing them like one at a time, um, we, we, we calculate the gradients sort of on average over all of the samples uh, in the data set, all right? So, um, So anyway, I mean, you, you can look at the um, the examples here. What, what it comes down to in practical terms is um, is. Um, our, our, our difference down here in, in um, when we're calculating our gradients, whether we're doing it just for a single item or we're, we're doing it for all the items at once, which is what's really happening down in the second version called batch gradient descent here. So, um, yeah, and then finally, kind of mini batch is sort of, um, it's sort of in between the two, okay? So there, there's trade-offs for doing either uh, single gradient descent or doing full batch gradient descent or doing these mini batches. So for mini batches, instead of taking the average over all of them, you like, um, like, like maybe do a, a batch of 10 items or 100 items. And then you calculate the gradients with respect to just uh, that, that small you know, mini batch, all right? Um, so the, the textbook, you, you, you'll definitely want to read the textbook's um, explanation for these. It's probably a little bit better. I cut out quite a bit of stuff um, um, on, on batch and mini batches here. So uh, the, the, the thing you probably should understand about these different kind of flavors of this is that um, um, so, so there's a trade-off going on. So if you, if you do your steps doing one individual item at a time for your gradient descent, um, It, um, th there'll be no sort of noise in um, the steps that you take, uh, but um, it, it'll be slower to, to get kind of down to where you want to go, right? Uh, but if you do like a full batch gradient descent, um, you're, you're, um, you're, you're doing like a steps over like an, an average of all the points. So that introduces possibly a lot of noise, right? So then mini batch is kind of in between those two extremes. So, so it won't be as noisy as, as doing the full batch gradient descent, um, um, but uh, you'll trade off a little bit of the speed that you have there. So. Um, All right, anyway, um, yeah. 
so you should read through those. Um, hopefully those will make better sense when you um, kind of read through, especially the, the great descent stuff, uh, look through our textbook on kind of ex explanation of using those. Um, Um, all right, yeah, like I said, I kind of want to wrap up here. Um, maybe I'll just say a few words about the assignment. Um, you know, as you, if, if you've already started working on it, you know, um, let me know if you have questions already. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, just to introduce you guys to it that are still here on. Um, so, um, on, on the third assignment, it's kind of, um, it's a little bit like a, uh, like, like a, um, like a, like a Kegel competition. So I've made like a mystery uh, linear regression function. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you kind of what the form is, but, but there is like a true function that you're going to be fitting here. Okay. So th some of the things I'm going to be talking about here won't make quite as much sense until you also look at the things about polynomial regression. Um, and regularization. So, um, so a lot of this assignment um, is is relying on those um, concepts as well here. So, um, but the basic idea is um, uh, there's a data set of a hundred artificial items out there that I generated with a particular function. Uh, it's actually a nonlinear function. So uh, you're going to have to do a polynomial regression instead of a straightforward linear regression. Right? Uh, but th this function, this polynomial function, has a degree somewhere between, um, I'm sure I described it here somewhere. So, so it's, it's a polynomial that has a degree somewhere between uh, a, a cubic, so degree three and degree 15, right? So you're gonna be taking the stuff that you learn um, about, you know, re regression and, and um, cost functions and, and then also about polynomial um, regression. Um, and uh, what you're supposed to be doing, so, so I kind of, uh, for the assignment, I, I kind of step you through um, trying to fit a, a good model to this mystery data, uh, and then also using regularization to try and tune your model here. Um, so yeah, so, so the basic idea on this um, third assignment will be, um, your your task is to try and recreate or discover what the actual degree of the what, what what the actual function was that I used to generate this mystery data. So there should be um, let me check make certain it's out there. There should be uh, this data out here for assignment three called assignment three data. Uh, it's a simple, you know, it, it's a simple data set. It's a simple regression data set. So there's a single feature, input feature, um, and then a, a label, right? But if you plot this data, I guess I didn't plot that for you. So your first task is to load it and plot it like you did for the previous assignment. But yeah, if, if, if you plot the data, you'll see that it's, um, um, that it doesn't really look linear, right? So a, a, a straight line is not gonna be a good model for this data. You need like a nonlinear predictor um, uh, for this set of data. All right, and then yeah, besides that, I mean, you know, I, I, I definitely help you get started on this. So um, we've talked a little bit about these things um, in, in um, the um, previous weeks, but you'll get more about these this week and next week, especially about learning curves and regularization, right? So, so, th so the heart of this third assignment is um, starting by trying to overfit. So, so, so um, 
create a model that's too powerful. So that'll give you some information about the function that you're trying to, to discover. Um, and then start adding the, these penalties. So, so start adding in some regularization. Um, and these will give you some better ideas about what the true degree of the polynomial is that you're trying to fit. Um, and then finally, kind of use that information to make your best estimate and give me your best model. Um, so kind of like a Kegel competition, I've also got some uh, data um, that's held back here. So I'll probably evaluate everybody's fit um, on that uh, on that held back data and then kind of give you sort of rankings on how you end up doing on your on your uh, fit here. So um, once you get done with this third assignment. So. All right. Um, yeah, I'm, so I'm going to have to probably kind of um, uh, close out here. I'm sort of losing my voice um, in any case. So. Was there any kind of anybody want to ask like a, a question or anything about anything at this point? So we've got this week and next week for this third assignment. Kind of looking ahead to that, I'm not certain. I had originally been thinking about a fourth assignment, but I think we might just do um, our midterm test after this third assignment and then have a, our next assignment after the midterm test here, just to let you guys know that are listening here. So. Um, all right. Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of sign off here. So as usual, let me know, you know, email me if you have any questions once you get started. Um, the midterm test, um, I've had some people ask about, about um, um, the content of it before this. It's probably actually going to be pretty similar to uh, your assignments, uh, except for uh, most likely I'm going to give you just uh, like maybe two days to work on it. So I'll have it open up on like a Thursday and, and, and you'll have to submit it by like Friday. So it'll be kind of similar to like your assignment two and assignment three, although the questions will be smaller. So I'll give you like a data set and say do like perform a linear regression on it or logistic regression or I don't know, um, some things like that. Uh, but it's probably gonna be a, another IPython notebook that you, that you fill out, you know, uh, with, with code, uh, maybe some, some written questions as well in the notebook and then submit that um, for, um, um, uh, for your answers, basically, so. Uh, all right, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and run. So yeah, go ahead and send me emails if you have any further questions or things, but I'll see you guys later then.